Welcome to this audio session recording taken at the Agroforestry Show, which was organised in September 2023 as a partnership between the Woodland Trust and the Soil Association. For more session recordings, go to agroforestryshow.com or explore and subscribe to the Agroforestry Show YouTube channel. Enjoy! Good afternoon, everybody. I think we'll, um, we'll just get started. Thank you so much for popping in. I hope you've all been enjoying the last few days. I certainly have. There's so much passion. There's been so many wild tangents um, in which everybody's been more interested than the main speaking points. We'll try not to do too much of that. Um, we've been talking loads about diversity in all its forms, mainly in biodiversity, um, in relation to resilience. Today we're going to talk about diversity in people and enterprise. So my esteemed colleagues here um, all have something to do with working with other people on their land in various different ways. Um, my name's Claire Byers. Um, I've come to this via a very convoluted um, career in geology, carbon trading, and more recently a degree in... Um, what was it again? Yeah, uh, <laughs> It was in agroforestry, actually, um, at the RAU. Um, and I did my thesis on this subject, um, trying to get more people to work together on land to overcome some of the barriers to agroforestry. So to introduce our lovely panel here, in order of speaking, we have Amanda um, from Wakelands. We've got Stuart, who's from the Woodland Trust. And we've got Jenny, who you can see is not Jeremy, who is otherwise um, publicised. Jenny has, is one of our sponsors uh, from Shakespeare Martineau. She's very kindly stepped in to help us with the legal side of our discussion. So without further ado, I'll get on and talk about collaborating. So this is some nice pictures and an explanation of why I'm standing here. And I just told you that. So I think we can move swiftly on. Um, the most important thing is that I am now putting my money where my mouth is and trying to do collaborative agroforestry with the wonderful tree source, Charlie, who's standing over there. Um, we're just getting started with a diverse uh, agroforestry scheme, including a uh, tree nursery. So what are we talking about when we talk about on-farm collaboration? So I like to define it as enterprise stacking, which I think most people in agroforestry are familiar with, but then with different people. So quite literally different organisations, different people working together on the same piece of land. So we've talked about collaboration, and DEFRA is really keen on it, as you all know, um, between farms and across landscapes. What we're looking at here is a little bit more micro. How do you share a field with somebody else, um, and why would you do it in the first place? So going back to why... There are lots of barriers to agroforestry uptake in this country. Um, it's still not really something that's practiced a lot. It used to be, but it isn't anymore. It's practiced all across the rest of the world. Um, I don't know if you read about this amazing grown-out Mayan food forest recently. We thought it was native forest, and now we realise that it was, in fact, planted. This It's not new. Um, we've forgotten about it, that's all. Um, but we have lots of barriers to it in this country. So the main one is probably, as everybody can imagine, money, because it's quite expensive to get started. Um, the next one, and I think this is the one that I'm most interested in, is skills. Um, we had a heated discussion yesterday in, in, in the tent about um, mono farming, and I think, actually, the kind gentleman who brought up the con conversation was expertise. You really get, you gain expertise by doing one thing and doing one thing a lot, and that's why monoculture became basically popular. So to expect someone to suddenly learn forestry or woodland management or orchard management, as well as running their existing farm, is quite unreasonable. So one of the ways that we can get around that is by bringing in an expert to do it. Um, land access is something I haven't heard many people talking about. Um, I know that the Land Workers Alliance are here, and that's one of their big things. But allowing young or people changing their careers, people onto land by, with access to an existing landowner or tenant's land is a really interesting way to get more interested people onto the land. Um, 
And the final one about which we're not going to spend very much time talking about is that there isn't very much in the way of markets for ag agroforestry products, although those are growing now, especially in our area, um, which is Somerset. So I made this beautiful slide and it's gone horribly wrong, so please forgive me. Um, why is collaboration a good idea in agroforestry? Well, it's to overcome those barriers that I was talking about. And um, I've got a picture of a deer on this because we can think of wildlife as our collaborators. I was actually looking for um, um, a blue tip, but it didn't fit in the space, but they, all the aphids. Anyway, so basically it's sharing the workload, it's sharing the financial load, it's sharing all sorts of things, purchasing efficiencies, operations, it's lowering your costs between two enterprises, um, but mainly it's about skills and knowledge sharing. Um, so when I did my thesis on collaboration, I talked to all these amazing people who were doing this and making it work. I actually also spoke to quite a few people who tried it and failed. Um, maybe fail is a bad word, tried it and didn't make it work for whatever reason. Um, I don't know if George Young is here. I think you probably all know him. He was super enthusiastic about the idea. He really, really wanted to work with lots of other people on his land. And he couldn't find anyone, couldn't find the right people. He said, I'm in the wrong place. So I asked him to come and talk on the panel today. And he said, no, because it didn't work for me. So this is not a panacea. But what I'm trying to present here is some of the ways that people who have been successful in these endeavors have made it work. And basically, they just treated it like a business but a really long-term business. They thought about, what do we both want? What are the details around this? Who's going to do what? Who's going to apply for subsidies? Who's going to take the, um, the share of the crops or the, um, the labor? They thought through their business plans really well. They made really good business, uh, financial models, and they thought about how things would work out if something went wrong. So, I mean, the worst thing that can happen is, of course, somebody dies. We do need to think about what will happen if someone dies and we can't continue in the way we had done. What happens if the farmer wants their land back but the trees have only been there for 10 years? What happens to the guy that owns, or girl, or other person, who owns the trees? There needs to be some form of rem remedy. So ultimately, what it came down to was really, really, really carefully thinking about what you both want, really thinking about having aligned business um, objectives, and then ultimately codifying it in a contract and I think that's the point that a lot of people start to feel a bit uncomfortable that I need to get a lawyer in and oh forget it it's just too much hassle but it doesn't have to be because ultimately if you've agreed all this stuff in advance it's really not so difficult and Jenny's going to touch on that quite a lot more so as my last slide I talked about how policy could potentially support on-farm co collaboration um, I don't know if we're that far yet, honestly. I'm probably being really optimistic, but I do think it's a huge tool in getting agroforestry off the ground, getting foresters on farming land and vice versa. Um, so just recognising collaboration as a tool would be a really good start. Um, DEFRA is really keen on financing agreements and legal elements for uh, landscape recovery across landscapes to look at allowing people to work together on one piece of land at the same time would also be really helpful. Um, a tree contractor or a tree enterprise can work several different farms. It doesn't have to just be one. Um, the next really big one, and that's something that I think everybody here is already doing, is create, create networking opportunities to bring the right people together to share skills. Um, they haven't really been happening. I mean, this is the first agroforestry show. Yay! Um, but we can do a lot more. I mean, we are so linked in, literally, and online. We don't have no barriers to linking up anymore. It's just having the initiative to do it. I'm going to leave it at that, because I think what you really want to hear is from these wonderful people who are actually doing this on their land. Um, at the end, we're going to have some questions and answers. I'd be really keen to hear from anybody who is also sharing their land or working on somebody else's land. I've certainly heard quite a few examples over the last days of people who've alluded to it. Love to hear how it's working for you, your problems, your learning points. But in the meantime, let's move on to Amanda.
Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. This could take a while, sorry. Well, hello everyone. I'm Amanda Rilling. I'm married to David Wolf, who's sitting over there, who's there to answer all the hard questions that you might <laughs> pose to me at the end. I don't usually do the speaking about Wakeland, so this is the first, the first for me at the first agroforestry, so treat me gently if you don't mind. Um, Anne and Martin Moore, so David's parents, um, were uh, bought Wakelands in 1992 and the, were the pioneers, if you like, of this um, very special site um, in Suffolk. And um, uh, it was intended really as an experiment, an extension of Martin's professional life as a, an agricultural scientist. Um, and 30 years later, we've inherited this very special site and it was an imperative, if you like, that we had to think of ways of um, maintaining the, the site and keeping it going as this um, long-standing agroforestry organic site. And also, in order to do that, we introduced enterprise stacking. So I hope what I'm going to do, mostly in pictures, is to give you a canter through what we've done really only in the last two or three years in order to keep Wakelands going as the site that it is, but also to bring in people and to take Wakelands to the next generation, if you like. Um, so if you don't know about us, we're a farm in um, East Anglia, just on the Norfolk Suffolk border on the Waveney Valley. And um, Anne and Martin bought that a farm and some uh, parcels of land looking a bit like that and um, a farmhouse um, in which they lived and some barns and all sorts of, of extra sort of buildings and um, uh, uh, tool shed uh, and so on, other things, other buildings. This is what it looked like in 1992. It was um, a wheat field um, into which two years later Martin planted trees. And this was a, a slightly bizarre concept in those days, I think, that you would turn a perfectly respectable wheat field um, into something where you planted tr uh, trees in the middle of it. Um, at the time, Martin was still working. Anne and Martin, at Martin had been, as I say, an agricultural scientist and had worked at the Plant Breeding Institute in Cambridge and then latterly worked in a um, scientific institute in Switzerland. And this was always meant to be part of his retirement, their retirement plans. And so um, they planted the trees before they came back. And by the time they came back to live at Wakelands in 97, um, the trees had already started to um, mature and develop. So in the same bit of land, by 2005, you see that the trees are starting to grow and um, you're starting to see there the, the, the sort of um, the development, if you like, of the agroforestry tree lines and then the cropping alleys in between. Now, because it was a, a sort of continuing experiment of Martin's scientific life, lots of what he did um, and in collaboration with others was still quite experimental. He had nobody to copy. so. The trees are spaced in a combination of 12 meter spacings, 15 meter and 18 meter, and you'll see that in a minute when I show you um, pictures of the rest of the site. But in the very early days, he was still experimenting and he had no one to copy, and therefore lots of mistakes were made. So what we're finding is that um, lots of what we do is um, make Wakelands available for people to come and see, to see how not to do it. Um, and, you know, that's also valuable in itself. So this, these are the same tree lines, apart from the top right, that's another section, but these are the same tree lines in the winter last year. And you can see that these are very clearly um, cropping alleys with semi-mature trees and um, in the in the timber uh, timber tree line section um, of uh, uh, you know almost 30 years later 
So there you get a much better picture of um, what the whole site looks like. And um, it really is in the, you know, Suffolk arable desert. And we are this oasis in the middle. And you can, you can see there really that the agroforestry um, is very clear to see. And if we just move in a little bit, there are various different sections of agroforestry, because as I say, Martin was still experimenting and he was experimenting with different um, trees, tree systems and, um, and different diversity within the tree lines. And so moving just closer in there, um, you'll see A, it, well that's the, that's the farmhouse, the, the farm buildings, the barns, um, the sheds, an office, a solar array and so on. B is a meadow, and then you can see very clearly there C, D and E are agroforestry systems. C is um, the hazel, that's um, hazel that is um, planted in two line strips and um, coppiced every seven years um, that produce for us amazing sticks. One of our most lucrative crops is sticks that we sell at £1.40 each which is pretty amazing. And if you were at the biomass talk yesterday, David went much more into the, um, into the economics and the reason, the rationale behind that. But as you can see there, that's, agro, that's one version of agroforestry that has one tree crop, if you like, that we coppice on a seven year cycle, um, but we're coppicing um, at different times. So there's, it's almost like a wave, you know, we're coppicing perhaps a quarter of it a year and then um, and then so you um, there's always a sort of tree line um, shield if you like in the in the cropping alleys because we don't chop the whole stop the whole lot down so then D is um, the fruit and nut trees and again I'll look more closely at, at it but this for me is the Anne influence as opposed to the Martin influence because Anne was very much involved in the selection and the diversity of the trees in, in, the, in the fruit and, and nut selections. And this really played towards food, the, the length of season that you have your tree line crops, the taste, the variety, and so on. Um, and so I think that is important in terms of what I'm gonna talk about in terms of stacking enterprises. E was the original planting that I showed you. That's, um, that's the old timber crop, um, oaks, hornbeams, um, cherries, and so on. So that is the sort of farmer's longer term investment, if you like. Um, and then just moving on F, just round the corner, that's the willow agroforestry. So on a similar sort of concept on the coppicing, we coppice now every two or three years and then you have cropping alleys in between. So that gives you a sort of broad outline of what it looks like and what developed, you know, 30-year-old agroforestry looks like, but on what we inherited, which was um, a demonstration site. It was never meant to be commercial. It was only ever meant to be Martin's retirement project, really. So then, um, Anne died in 2016, Martin died in 2019, and um, literally one of his deathbed wishes was to bring together all the people that um, he'd been collaborating with to see what you can make of Wakelands. No pressure there then. So we had this symposium, and um, the range of different people um, were uh, were very sure that they wanted Wakelands to continue um, and they wanted it to continue as a site of scientific, scientific interest where people could come and visit, where it would be seen as the demonstration site for agroforestry and that was seen as the essential if you like um, and then the desirable was for it to stay as a, a hub for um, uh, for sort of local initiatives, but also part of the agroecological um, uh, sort of message, if you like, and for it to, it to stay as an important um, 
uh, site to take things forward. Thank you. So, I mean, also a bit of background. This is David and I, um, so David and his brother, Toby, who inherited Wakelands. Um, Toby lives in Ireland, so it's really down to David and me. Um, this is not our day job, if you like. David is, um, David is a barrister trying to save the world with doing climate change litigation, and I work in a barrister's chambers. And so this, it also had to be um, something that we could um, keep all these things going, but not requiring us to be there all the time because we have our jobs and we have, this is not our life, this is a, this is a con continuation of um, Anne and Martin's project, if you like, um, but obviously we wanted <coughs> to keep it going. And in order to keep it going, we had to think of ways of developing it to draw people um, in and to, um, to have people there to keep it going. So um, in order for us to continue with the Wakelands project, we wanted to continue with um, the organic farming. It had been organic for 30-odd um, years um, with no external inputs. We haven't had any animals. Um, and so that was something that we wanted to make sure that we could continue in, in the story. Obviously, the agroforestry is a given. And then we started to think about, and this came from the symposium, the short supply chains, short food chains and short supply chains, and then this concept of enterprise stacking. Um, and for us, that meant people and also continuing the research but um, continuing the research by collaborating with other people because we're not the scientists and this isn't our thing, if you see what I mean. So in terms of the, the diverse organic agroforestry, um, that looks like this is an example of the tree lines. Um, as I say, um, there's no one tree line. This is in the you know, the, the, the Anne section, if you like, the home field, that's got such a wide, diverse variety of, of fruit trees um, that um, there was no... Um, it meant that the season is very long. Um, food um, harvesting is very uh, sort of diverse and not difficult, but it's, it's not for a commercial setup, if you like. Um, and that just gives you an example of what you get from one tree line and one um, alley next door to it where we were growing squash. On, for example, the, um, the apple trees, we have 40 different varieties of apple. I think Anne chose that for um, the diversity of taste and flavours and also um, the length of season. So we get, you know, our, our apple season, if you like, starts around now. Um, before now and then we'll go into October and November with apples so but there was no there's no sort of one commercial crop if you like um, this is an anecdote in our first year when we were there we decided to make sure that this year we harvested everything that we wouldn't waste the fruit um, that's on the trees because it had been previously um, and so we um, engaged local teenagers, we paid them the living wage, um, they picked cherries, we tried to sell them into the chintzy fruit shop in Southwold and she wasn't interested because, um, you know, she couldn't pay us enough and um, uh, it just, it was economically unviable. So these were our learning um, sort of months, if you like, immediately um, after um, Martin died and when we were then thinking about how this was going to work again uh, we picked the cherries this is my dad weighing cherries um, trying to think about how we then sell them out into the local shops and markets but it it just wasn't going to be viable um, this is the willow so we were continuing with the agroforestry and the willow coppicing selling sticks and then in the alleys in between our crop, if you like, is we grow squash, we grow lentils. So in 2015, um, we, we have collaborated a lot with Hobmadods, if you know them. Um, we grew the first organic um, Suffolk lentils in 2015 as a trial, and then we've been um, growing them commercially 
um, a high value crop since 2015. So that continued. Okay, we're running out of time. All right, I'll, 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 sk I'll skip ahead. So this is the wheat, right. So, and we were doing that, but a single enterprise attempting an agroforestry for us, because of the site that we inherited and on the scale that we inherited, wasn't operationally sustainable. So, terminal, so on enterprise stacking for us, that means um, uh, there are different versions of enterprise stacking and for us it's not this, it's not um, diversifying our farm operation. For us, it's um, independent businesses um, or projects with whom we collaborate and we provide space, we provide, um, uh, we collaborate, we have shared use of things, of buildings, um, of um, equipment and so on and um, we we run as a brand I mean Wakelands now is is growing as a brand in itself there was a uh, talk about branding earlier but that's because we have these different businesses that are themselves making a big noise but under the umbrella of Wakelands and that's sort of what it looks like now Willow, um, Bees, the Real Veg CSA, No Dig CSA Hemp, hemp, we're hemp growers, and of course the key to that is the Wakelands Bakery, which is at the heart of it. And there's lots of um, interconnected relationships that go on between them, um, and we are the umbrella of all of those things. So their success is our success, um, but they wouldn't be able to do any of that um, unless we provided them and we hosted them and we enabled them. We see it, David and I see ourselves as the enablers of all these things to happen. So um, that's Henrietta in the bakery and uh, Lachmi when we were hosting an event. Um, the point is Henrietta makes bread from our wheat in the bakery, but she also now makes, um, she makes produce from the tree line. So that is then thinking about the, the short food chain, if you like. I'll just skip forward a few. We do, we've got squash. This is the CSA um, veg. They've got two alleys. Um, this is what the hemp um, operation looks like. They're growing hemp for textiles. And then we're also collaborating with some architects to use the, the inside of the, the hemp plant, the shiv, for an architectural project. Um, we've got Willow Phoenix, so they're um, Willow workers and they run courses. And as I say, the collaboration is we share resources, spaces, equipment, facilities, buildings like that, a fridge trailer that has the fruit in it. It has David's weekly beer delivery, as you can see. Um, we, we, can sh we can share in terms of people resources as well as um, infrastructure resources. And we have these big shared event days so agroforestry open weekend we've mentioned apple days coming up the first wakelands dal festival we grow lentils we had a dal festival it was a big success so and that all feeds into everyone the enterprise is being showcased and collaborating to do their thing and it's a joyous thing because it does bring people the diversity of people and all the things that they do um, and um, we can still continue with um, things like research and hosting very interesting things um, because we have this sort of shared endeavour, if you like. Um, we have a Wakelands website, but the enterprises have got microsites within them. So as I say, about making a big noise, you don't have, we don't have to do all of that, we just have to host it. Um, and that's what it looks like when we're sort of out on the road. We look like one thing, but that's actually six different enterprises. Um, we're making such a big noise. We were up for BBC Food and Farming Awards last year as uh, Farming for the Future. We were finalists, very proud of that. Really, literally, after two years of running. Yep, yeah, I'm nearly at the end. The bit that you want to know about is how do we do it? How do we attract people? Well. We've sort of attracted people organically. Um, Henrietta was introduced by Josiah from Hogmadods, 
and then really everything sort of grew from there once you've got food you can have people come and um, stay because we can provide them with food and then um, we had um, the veg growing operation and and so on people talk to each other and when we invite people in we're always saying if you know of anyone let you know let us know and we're happy to talk to anyone about um, a stacked enterprise um, we do have a contract it is legal David's a lawyer after all we do have um, legal contracts but it's legal not legalistic um, there is a sort of clear mutual understanding about what we're trying to achieve and um, their obligations and what we will give if you like and um, and we have uh, uh, shared values if you like the main challenges and the main benefits um, uh, the, I start with the benefits because the benefits are the people, the ideas, the support, the collaboration, being there, being on site when we're, you know, in London doing our other thing. Um, and it's that feeling that it's a working operation. Operationally, it works because people are there. Um, the challenges are also the people. It's the relationships. Um, it's managing expectations. And it's um, a need to get that right. And we work hard at getting that right. Um, but it seems to be working. Two years on, it seems to be working. And, yeah, that's the end. Thank you. <laughs> Hello, everyone. Um, so my name's Stuart Home. I work for the Woodland Trust as a, an outreach manager. A little bit of background for me. Uh, I started working with FWAG uh, back in 1999. I was a farm conservation advisor for about 11 years. Uh, and then I came across the Woodland Trust and started to do woodland creation. And I've got my own little family farm up in Leicestershire. And about two years into working with the Woodland Trust, uh, a crazy farmer called David Rose uh, rang up and said he'd quite like to do some of this agroforestry stuff. And everyone panicked and threw it my way because they knew that I'd done a little bit of farming and had a little farm. So I spent a lot of time then trying to work out what agroforestry was myself and then going out and doing advice on it. So I've been playing about with this for probably about 10 years now. Um, and I think what I'm going to do is sort of give you a little bit of an overview of what, what, uh, what we look at to start off with, what your relationships could be with the Woodland Trust if you're looking to, to set up agroforestry, and some of the key points to sort of start with and to take you through. So one of the things we always start off with is, is, is why do you want agroforestry? And I'm often asked um, whether uh, by people that they want to do agroforestry, that they're really keen on doing it and what the best thing to do is. And I think that's where you, you've got to make that decision. And it's really tricky because you come to an event like this, you get inspired, you go away, you really want to do something and you can't quite work out whether it's making cider, growing trees for wood chip, growing long-term timber, etc., etc. And there's a whole wealth of that, and we're changing our views on it. We're moving more into nut production, et cetera, et cetera. So there's a whole wealth of where we want to take that and how we can sort of take that forward. So <clears throat> within the Woodland Trust, I have an advisory team. They can come out and start to give you advice on the ground. But it's first and foremost, it's about getting those rough ideas in your head as to what you want. So we'll look at the type of agroforestry that you're going to do um, and try and work around what it is, what your business is. And you look at um, alley production, we've got plenty of that, and we've got plenty of examples through the likes of Stephen Briggs, who you've probably seen in the last uh, 24, 48 hours um, presenting somewhere. And that's great, that's, that's sort of one end of the scale. And I think our views have changed on that. So where we were looking at 24 metre um, between, the, uh, between the alleys and three metre widths, we'd probably start to look at a whole different range of, of, of trees now different root stocks to give wider spacing, which means that we can sort of, uh, and, and a slightly wider width in the, in the, in the row, if you, were alley, if you were arable farming, it's probably a, going to be a much better fit. We do an awful lot of silvopastoral stuff, so when we're starting to look at that, it's very much around the shelter and the shade. Couldn't we bloody do with some of that today? Um, so there's a whole wealth of, of, of pulling that together so that we can get the best out of that with browsing and use of, uh, use of hedges and shrubby edge, edges to pull that together. And then natural regeneration is starting to form a lot more of, a, of, of where we're looking at wood pasture and wood pasture recreation. 
Um, so on an advisor visit, what, what we're doing, what we're wanting to do is, is to help with that, our relationship building with you, our collaboration building with you. We have a grant scheme that we can help you out to, do, to deliver your agroforestry. And what we want to do is, is make sure that you're putting it in the right place. So we'll do a desk-based survey, we'll do an overview, we'll check that you've got triple SI woodlands, schedule on ancient monuments, that you're not going to put the, 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 the trees, the woodland in the wrong place. And we can talk <coughs> to the Forestry Commission on your behalf and make sure that we're getting you the best grants and the, and the best advice. We do an on-site um, visit quite soon because there's quite a lot of things that flag up, gas mains, like, uh, electricity main, uh, wires, stuff that on your farm you won't see. Uh, because you see it every day and it becomes invisible is quite obvious to us when we come out. So a second pair of eyes looking at it afresh really makes a big difference. And that archaeology, the degrading of different habitats is, is really important because again, we don't want to degrade habitats. We want to, we want to really benefit what you've got and grow what you've got on the farm and on the site. Um, <clears throat> you've probably heard orientation is very, very uh, important. If we're doing light, if you're doing alley cropping, we really want to be trying to get that to a sort of a, a, a north-south orientation as, as quickly as possible. Um, <clears throat> but some of the other things that we want to talk to you about when we're coming out is that preparation. You only get to prep your ground once, um, and so we want to make sure that you're doing it in the right way, that you're doing the right subsoiling, the right cultivation, that within those alleys or within that area you're planting the right crop and uh, uh, beneath the canopy of the trees and that you're using the right sorts of materials. It's interesting with uh, Amanda say, uh, saying about um, that there's lots of things going wrong on the site. I spend most of my time taking people around agroforestry sites explaining why I've made a cock up on this site and why these shelters didn't work and why you shouldn't graze with sheep in certain times and you should mob graze and, and, and work out. But we've made those mistakes over the last 10 years with, with, uh, with, with farmers, so we can pass that information on to you so that you don't have to. And we're always learning with this. Agroforestry has been about forever, as you were sort of saying, uh, but it's just that whole sort of um, factor that we're only starting to bring it into mainstream agriculture in the last sort of 10, 15 years, so it's becoming more acceptable. So design is really important as well with all, within all of this, and I think that's the... Uh, a, a key to having a good and successful application, uh, um, uh, agroforestry site is that you get the design right. You get your uh, areas for going in and extracting, for going in and, and harvesting right. And if you're looking at David's up here, which uh, which took quite a lot of working out, we've got um, we've brought into this design an area where we've got domesticised trees. So we've got apples and pear trees through the middle. But we wanted this to frame and look like a woodland at the end of uh, 20, 30 years and not just an agroforestry strip farming. Um, so what we've done is we've integrated lots of different edible trees into this woodland. So there's lots of, of native edible trees. So if you look at this in 20 years' time, it should look like a woodland with lots of edible trees in the middle of it and not just a great big orchard across the field. So we can help to design that. Uh, and then this is my last slide. I always put this one on because I've got a cocker spaniel and I've got very, very, very limited photos of a sat still. So this is up at the Allerton Trust at, uh, in, in Loddington, if anybody knows that. was the Game Wildlife Conservation Farm where we did quite a big um, uh, silver pastoral scheme up there looking at shelter and shade. Uh, and we were lucky enough there to look at lots of different densities to see how that best integrates with the, with the, far, with the, uh, with the grazing and with the farming on, the, on site. So it's not a replicable agroforestry scheme, but what it's doing is showing areas where we've got different uh, degrees of density which could be replicated on your farms in, in your areas as a wood pasture. So just to summarise quickly, the Woodland Trust has got its own grant scheme. If you're interested, please do pop across and see us and we can organise a, a chat with an advisor and possibly a visit going forwards. We've got a demonstration tent that's set up so you can come and bring your maps or a piece of paper or a scribbled little bit of off of one of the back of your notepads and we can help you half design or at least start your design off for your agroforestry. Um, because it's our own grant scheme, there's very little paperwork um, and you get an advisor visit, which is really helpful no matter where you are. Even if you've got it fully designed, run it past us. We might just spy something that you haven't. Um, our main uh, area for tree supply is that we make sure that everything is United Kingdom and Ireland sourced and grown, so that's a very big area for us to, to tie into. We want to make sure that all the trees that you're growing as part of your scheme fit into that category. 
but we can help with that and we can put you in the right direction of, of, of nurseries that are going to help you in the, in the, and, and be able to sell you those trees. Uh, and then we don't want to go away. We want to build this relationship with you guys and take it forwards. So we've got ongoing help. So you'll have an advisor that, that's talking to you and they'll be about for, hopefully, for quite a long while whilst your agroforestry comes because we'll need to, at some stage, probably borrow your agroforestry site to set up a silly agroforestry event on and come and have a wonder around that. So that is me over. I'm sorry it's a bit whistle stop, but I, we're, we're, we're obviously running on tech, so I shall pass over now to Jeremy. Um, <laughs> Yeah, hi, I'm Jenny Wielden. I'm a, a solicitor and partner in the agricultural team at Shakespeare Martineau. I advise farming clients on um, their property agreements, contractual arrangements, partnerships. So um, whilst I've been drafted in very, very last minute for this, um, I'm hoping I can talk with some confidence because I'm talking to clients about this day in and day out. So we've been looking at going into collaboration with other individuals on your farm, on your land, um, and where do we start with that? So let's start with who's entering into the agreement, start at the beginning. So we're looking at the entity, and that, that's twofold. So from the land owner perspective or tenant perspective, it, are you entering into it as you, as an individual? Will Do you farm in a partnership with family? Um, will it be the partnership that's entering into it or do you want to set up a company or a special vehicle that will manage this particular new venture or element that you're considering? And then you're looking at the people that you're going into partnership with and what entity works there. Are they coming to the table as an individual? Are they coming as a special purchase setup company specially for this? Or are the two of you going to go into partnership together? Are you going to be two individuals with a vision looking to make money, essentially? So lo lots to think about. And there isn't one answer fits all. Some of it will come down to the length of the agreement that you're looking at, the strength of um, covenant in terms of um, buying power of either party, what's, what are each party bringing to the table. and also your tax position, you're, you must, if you're looking at this, be talking to your accountants and your tax advisors because um, it would be awful to go down one of these ventures and find out that there's then an adverse tax consequence that no one had foreseen. Um, the other thing to think about is third party consents. Are you free to enter into these arrangements? If you're a tenant farmer, you'll need to understand the terms of your tenancy agreement, whether your landlord has given you freedom to do that or you need their consent to do it. If you're um, a freehold landowner but have a mortgage, again, the mortgage company may have restrictions there. If you're in partnership or in trust, again, those agreements could have um, restrictions within them. So just understand what you're allowed to do. And then the other thing, which is always a bit uncomfortable to talk about, is the finances, but it's important. So where's the money coming from? Who's financing what? Who's most, who is at financial risk? If you're both at financial risk, where are those risks lying? Um, you need to talk, be talking about that up front because you've also been within that talking about the exit strategy. So if you're bringing things to the table and things don't work out or something unforeseen happens, how do we extract then? Um, lots of different types of structure of agreement we can look at. Um, for time, I'm not going to explain what they all are. I'm just going to list them for the minute. But we've got licenses, leases, share farming agreements, contract, contract farming agreements, joint venture agreements, conditional arrangements, partnerships, whole host of legal documentation out there, um, all of which um, it will be suitable for different arrangements, but it's going to need to be considered in view of what you're doing. I don't think you can go off the shelf at this stage we're not this is new um, in terms of what we're coming together and each and people are coming with different motivations different desires different outcomes we can't just be um, thinking there's a one-size-fits-all um,
Yes, um, so the, yeah, the type of agreement that you're picking um, or the type of arrangements that you've come to, again, just be aware that some of those bring with them their own statutory provisions to where you've got people living on site. There'll be certain conditions actually as to when, you're when you would be able to ask them to leave and um, with certain um, agricultural tenancies, again, statute can kick in um, and actually you might not be able to terminate when you had first foreseen you would. So again, getting the advice, understanding that and being flexible when you're putting these together that if when you come to sit with your advisors it isn't quite what you expected, then um, be prepared that there might need to be some changes there. Um, and that sort of leads me on to really that flexibility within the agreement, sort of where you're going into joint ventures and perhaps you don't quite know what the outcome's going to be yet because as Claire said at the outset some of these need to be long-term arrangements because of what's been the crops that are being cult and the trees that have been cultivated on site but the outcomes may be a bit more blurred you want flexibility there you want the abilities to retract understand how people exit understand how you might vary it if there's a change or a new opportunity that comes along but then there's also going to be hard lines there's going to be points where you just don't go beyond and amanda was saying to me that they've got a very clear vision um where she's farming and a set of principles and for some some of you here you may be being approached to collaborate that haven't actually sat down and thought about those principles and agreements because you've never been called upon before. But n before you charge ahead, that's something to take a step back and think about. Um, and I've touched on exiting and termination, but alongside of that also comes dispute. Um, think about what, what you want to happen if you, all things go wrong. But equally, legal documentations are pieces of paper that would need to be enforced in the courts. So, Think about the people that you're going into partnership with. If you haven't got a long relationship with them, do you need to be thinking about a shorter term agreement initially? Do you need to be looking for something, maybe not charging to the big project? Are there some smaller things you can work on together? Or have they got references? Have they Can they be recommended? Because what ultimately you don't want to do is be coming to see me to say, it's all gone terribly wrong, I need to sue them. And whilst you've got a right to sue them, they've got no money there. And it, it, that can be a really difficult and sad position to be in. Then in terms of timings, um, like I said, there's an important consideration, like how long are these agreements going to be? If you need flexibility, what points are you going to stop at to have a chat, to have a rediscussion, have a redefine? You can work in breaks, you can work in pause points. So don't feel that you have to agree to 25 years immediately in a commercial situation. You might not have to, but you may need to work out how you're going to compensate upfront investment if that's part of the deal. Um, and to some extent, these are bespoke agreements. I know we've touched on costs and, and um, lawyers are an another additional cost. Um, but um, you probably will say I will say this, but I think it's worth investing in getting the right advice before you sign up to something, before you press ahead. Um, and, but talking with your advisors early on, shaping what you want to do with them actually can have a really good cost bearing um, on it rather than having spent a lot of money only to be told actually no you can't do that or it won't work the way you want it to or you haven't thought about this tax consideration and it falls away. Equally please be aware that there are organisations out there that will support you with your legal costs. Um, myself and the firm that I work at we're an NFU panel firm and the NFU do provide really good contributions towards contract checking and discounts in legal fees and I'm sure there are other organisations out there that support their um, members in the same way. Thank you all very much for your contributions. Um, it strikes me that we're all doing a lot of designing here. Um, Amanda's trying to design her collaborations around something that she's inherited. Um, Stuart's trying to design agroforestry systems around future collaborations like David Rose's and, well, Jenny's save a bit, everybody's asses at the end of the day, aren't they? Um, we don't have very much time, so I'd be really grateful if you could keep your questions short and to the point. Um, also be really interested to hear from anybody who is working together in a collaboration like the ones that have been discussed.
Yeah. Um, uh, do, do you know of any websites where we can find templates for legal agreements or, or anything like that? Um, so, like I said, a lot of this is um, is quite new. Um, so, um, in brief, not templates. No. Um, we work from precedent, and we may be able to direct you to some that are suitable, depending on what what you're doing. But arguably. Um, the best agreements that you can get will be those that have been designed specifically for what you're doing. Hi, um, how much would you expect an average agreement to cost? Uh, an average agreement for what? <laughs> uh, for a shared land use arrangement. So sh shared, share la like a share farming type agreement? No, or more like of a, like a contract type arrangement? So licenses, if we're going sort of down the license route, um, traditionally we're looking at costs sort of varying from sort of £750 up to about £1,250. Um, what will come into that will be around the complexity and the detail and the length of term. So um, th there is sort of a, a risk factor there that if it, this was like a 20-year agreement, then I think you probably would be looking at much more significant costs given that you'd be dedicating a significant proportion of life <laughs> into that agreement and, and profit, that sort of thing. Um, Amanda, could you say a little bit more about the, the um, agreements you have with your different enterprise uh, people in that do you rent them the land? Do they pay a pr share of profits? How, how, and, or is it different for different Yes, it's, it's slightly different for the different enterprises. Um, we are also at the very start, if you like, the first two years in, so I'm sure they'll develop over time. Um, so, for example, with the bakery, with Henrietta and the bakery, um, we uh, we gift her the obviously the produce from the land, if you like. Um, but we get a loaf of bread a week, which is very delicious, and it's in our interest for her business to be successful. So, over so we put the infrastructure in place for the bakery, um, and. Um, over time, when she reaches a certain threshold, we'll then start to profit share with her. So that's one agreement of one particular activity. Um, with the others, with the CSA um, Real Veg team, we uh, the arrangement is that, that we have three of their 35 veg boxes a week, um, but we keep one and the bakery has two because what comes out of the bakery is the produce from the land. Um, and so that's that particular arrangement. So um, they have the land, um, they pay their water costs um, for irrigation um, and their electricity <coughs> costs, but we've, you know, we, we give the land, if you like, um, so that that's not on a rental agreement, but we get three, three veg boxes that goes back into the cycle. Um, so they're two examples, really, uh, of how different they all are. Hi there. Um, local farmer down West Cornwall. Um, I am taking on a community garden, um, a small portion of unused land on the farm. And I just wanted to talk whether there's any signposts when it comes to connecting local community to someone like myself who whose grandfather owns land, and my parents are quite happy for me to do the project, and I wonder whether there's anything you can offer for me to be signposted towards, and whether anything, anything is out there that exists currently. So, are you setting up a CSA? Not, cur not currently, no. So possibly, possibly in the future, a yeah. CSA sort of approach. Um, so there's a really great website called uh, Land Partnerships, um, and they talk about all different ways that you can work on the land with other people. Um, that would probably be the first place I go, but um, there's lots of CSAs around that are really, really useful sources of information, and I think the Land Workers Alliance are probably here somewhere as well. There you go. Um, meet <laughs> each other. Yeah, great, thank you. <laughs> there's an organisation, it's definitely in Wales, I don't know if you have it in England as well, it's called the CLAS, Community Land Advisory Service. It's connected to social farms and gardens. I don't think we've got one in the UK, England. We Sorry. lost that, apparently. Okay. <laughs> That's sad. 
Okay, I think we have run slightly over time, so unless there's anybody who wants to share their collaborations with us, it's a real shame, there's loads of them around. Um, I'd say go and get some fresh air. Thank you so much for coming. Thank you for listening. We'd like to thank our lead sponsor, Sainsbury's, and our other major sponsors, Farmers Weekly Transition, Forestry Commission, and Till Hill, and all the attendees for making this show such an overwhelming success. To get advice and support for your agroforestry project, either visit woodlandtrust.org.uk forward slash plant or soilassociation.org forward slash agroforestry.